Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mark Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Washington. He also holds appointments as an adjunct professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine and as in bioethics and humanities. Dr. Sullivan is the uh, co-director of the Behavioral Health Services at the University of Washington Center for Pain Relief, and he has been a clinician there and in it, that uh, center's predecessor centers for over 25 years. And Dr. Sullivan's published over 225 peer review articles, many of which are on chronic pain. Thanks. Thank you, Lee. Thanks for having us down here. It's beautiful to be in Medford. So, why did I pick this picture? Because I wanted to say, not all traumas relevant to chronic pain are this visible. I, I did, I like this picture particularly because it gives you a little, in case you can't see the bump, <laughs> there's an asterisk there if you want to help identifying the trauma, and in fact, it's, there's a little key here if you wanted to know what the, what the asterisk is about. So this, this is the simplest part of the talk. The other parts may not be quite so straightforward. So what I want to talk about is uh, trauma and uh, pain, and I'm going to talk about trauma a little bit more broadly than usual. This is sort of what we're presented with. Patients come in, as Dr. Taubin uh, made clear, they often complain of pain. And they frequently have a, um, a story about how uh, physical trauma, whether it be that lifting that box at work or the car accident or uh, tripping over something, uh, produced the pain. That's a part of the story that we understand really uh, quite well. Uh, although, uh, we don't really know why uh, some traumas produce chronic pain and not just acute pain. Uh, I think it's pretty fair to say that the nature of the trauma, with some exceptions when it involves nervous system injury, neuropathic pain, rarely has much to do with whether chronic pain is developed, but, it's, but sometimes it does. But the, the nature of the physical trauma is often not enough information to understand why chronic pain is developing or why it develops the way that it does. There's other factors involved, and I want to make an argument today that psychological trauma is at least part of that story. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't the whole story, that uh, the situation, this picture, also has self-perpetuating elements in it that are unfortunate but true. Uh, first of all, uh, psychological trauma itself can be psychologically traumatic, and I'm sure we've heard this from our patients. Uh, often this means that the trauma or the situation or the injury posed overwhelming threat to the patient, that it wasn't just that they were physically damaged, but they were psychologically overwhelmed by the event. And maybe a little bit less intuitively uh, is the cycling back from psychological trauma to physical trauma. And I'll describe a little bit about why this occurs, but people who've been traumatized, unfortunately, they often have a disturbed sense of what's safe. They are hyper-aroused. It leads to a lot of risk-taking behavior. And uh, you can see people who've been psychologically traumatized, and more than by chance, they seem to get re-physically traumatized. They're doing the kinds of things that produce uh, repeat trauma, and this ends up in being a very unfortunate but self-perpetuating situation. So I'm going to talk about a patient that I've taken care of. In fact, I think I uh, helped uh, manage her with Dr. Taubin. Uh, I'll call her Suzanne. That's not a real name. She was a 36-year-old woman with chronic abdominal pain. And she'd had onset this pain when she was 29. Uh, unfortunately, she had diverticulosis with an abscess and underwent a sigmoid colectomy. So that's pretty rough for being 29. We, most of us don't get diverticulosis until 30 or 40 years later. 
But on top of that, uh, in August of 2011, uh, she was stabbed in the right lower quadrant uh, by an unknown man outside her apartment. Now, she actually didn't have a really severe injury. She had a superficial abdominal wound and some bruises. But it was within the context of a really difficult life situation. She was going through a difficult divorce at that time and she, after the loss of a pregnancy, so multiple layers of stress and trauma going on, and she actually had the theory that her husband was taking revenge on her for the divorce and that he may have hired this guy who came and stabbed her. Um, she denied that she'd had earlier trauma, that she had ever been assaulted, raped, or otherwise traumatized. However, she had pretty much no memory uh, of her high school years following her parental divorce. And as I'll talk a little bit later, big gaps in your memory is something that sometimes accompanies trauma. So that was kind of her background. And uh, when you talked to her, uh, she did uh, give you a story consistent with the diagnosis of PTSD. She had recurrent nightmares of being stabbed. She was on edge all the time, had an increased startle response. She avoided reminders of the stabbing and, in fact, couldn't go on that side of her apartment, the, the sidewalk on that side of her apartment building where she had been stabbed. She also showed substantial emotional numbing and withdrawal. She was really not socially engaged or available uh, to friendships or, or other relationships. And the interesting thing about this is that until she got to our clinic, nobody had really talked to her about that stuff. It didn't really seem relevant. The issue was her abdominal pain. That's what she was seeking care for. She wasn't seeking care for PTSD, and it was only after we said that this might be one factor that's keeping your pain going and making it resistant to treatment with other modalities that it was brought into her treatment. We'll come back to her in the end. So let me talk a little bit about psychological trauma. It's a bigger category than PTSD. PTSD is one of various consequences that might happen after psychological trauma. It's the most famous one, and it's the one I'm going to focus on the most. But, and you have to have psychological trauma to get PTSD. So it basically means that you've experienced, witnessed, learned about, or had repeated exposure to actual or threatened deaths, serious injury, sexual violence, something that A, threatened you, and B, overwhelmed you is usually what it takes. And that can vary. I mean, it's pretty clear from studies of traumatized veterans and other populations that it's both the severity of the trauma and what the person, who the person is, both in terms of their experiences in the past and their own genetic and psychological makeup that determines whether PTSD results from the trauma. So, PTSD has kind of been around for a while in various forms. In the, in the Civil War, uh, you know, morphine and the hypodermic needle kind of became first available in the Civil War. And there was quite the epidemic of opiate addiction following the Civil War. And historians really feel that some of what's been going on is the same thing that goes on now, which is we have traumatic stress self-medicated with opiates and alcohol. Is everyone familiar with that story? That's been going on since the Civil War. Um, in the 1900s, there were psychologists beginning to describe the fact that war trauma seemed to reactivate childhood traumas and conflicts. And we still see that, that veterans who had uh, childhood trauma are much more likely to come home with PTSD. They're like primed. They've already been traumatized and they can get re-traumatized during the war and come back with PTSD. So the most common term used in World War I um, was shell shock. Uh, it's interesting that they use that term because uh, they thought it was a physical effect of being around artillery shells, uh, which it's not. It's due to a psychological, not a physical trauma. But in the modern period, and in fact in the Iraq-Afghanistan period, we now know that a lot of PTSD occurs with traumatic brain, brain injury. So in, in a way we've come full circle back to the World War I model because 
that was one of the first wars where there were a lot of artillery shells, and now we've got all these IEDs or, you know, uh, explosive devices where there's a lot of, uh, that's the way that injuries are occurring. In World War II, uh, it was called combat neurosis, concentration camp syndrome, battle fatigue. Again, people were kind of grasping for what's the nature of this issue, what causes it. Um, the common treatment in World War II was getting people back out into the battlefield as much as possible, um, and that actually uh, works if it's possible. It was only with the Vietnam War that our modern syndrome of PTSD really started to be described, and uh, that is largely the concept that we're working with now, is the one that originated from PTSD, I mean from Vietnam. Um, <clears throat> the latest iteration, uh, DSM-5, the fifth version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual from the APA, uh, came out in 2013, so let me talk a little bit about how PTSD is defined there. So, as I mentioned, you've got to have exposure to a traumatic event. It has to have a serious amount of threat with it, death, serious injury, some kind of threat to your integrity. So it doesn't have to be, you know, a threat of death per se, a threat to your basic integrity of other kinds is adequate. And then your response, there has to be an emotional response of being overwhelmed, intense fear, helplessness, etc. Then, after you've had the trauma, you have what are called uh, traumatic event intrusions. So, recurrent, involuntary, distressing memories. All of a sudden, you just cannot seem to forget. And in fact, people have studied PTSD as kind of a model of not forgetting. Uh, I have a colleague, uh, one of my colleagues who ran the Primate Center at the University of Washington, actually studied with Pavlov who did the Pavlovian conditioning about the drooling dogs. Well, it turned out that Pavlov was also interested in whether there was a kind of learning that you couldn't extinguish, meaning that once you've learned it, you can't unlearn it. And the, the paradigm that he settled on for that kind of learning was uh, dropping dogs down a stairwell. It, it turns out, if you put a net at the bottom so that they're not injured, but you throw them down the stairwell and uh, they never unlearn fear of the stairwell. You can take them hundreds of times back out onto the stairs and they never unlearn it. So that, as cruel as that sound, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting model for PTSD because this is specifically bad memories that you can't unlearn on, you, on your own. Um, so in addition to recurrent memories, uh, a lot of these patients have recurrent distressing dreams. I'm gonna talk to you about uh, some new medication that, that is helpful for, for dreams like that, but uh, that's often one of the very worst parts about PTSD for people. Um, they can get what seem like dreams during the middle of the day called flashbacks, where they feel even though they're awake, they're like back into the middle of their traumatic situation. Uh, they really don't like being reminded, you know, they don't like to watch movies about what they went through, they don't like to go back to the corner where they had the car accident, they don't like to be uh, down, Suzanne didn't like to go down that sidewalk, the side of her apartment building, and they become intensely physiologically aroused, you know, it could be sweating, it could be chest pain, it could be headaches at the uh, confrontation with a reminder. And they work hard to avoid these reminders. They will just stop going to that part of town. They will uh, stop seeing any of their friends that were associated with that event. Uh, they will also do some very uh, vigorous kinds of struggling that uh, Kevin talked about to avoid reminders, feelings, thoughts that might be associated with that uh, experience. So in addition to that, there's a, an enduring a uh, kind of negative atmosphere or cloud to their internal experience. Uh, they are often, you know, it's kind of surprising, but as traumatic as the event was, they'll often not be able to describe it completely. Because they go through, uh, partly because they were overwhelmed and they were unable to process, you know, what color was the cab, what kind of day was it, all that sort of stuff they may have no access to even though they weren't uh, knocked out. They didn't lose consciousness, but yet there's like this blank spot because they underwent what was called peritraumatic dissociation. 
they kind of went on a little mental vacation. It's like the fuse blew or the circuit breaker flipped while they were in the middle of the trauma. And it is a sign that they were unable to process it, they were unable to metabolize it kind of psychologically at the time, and now they don't have access to parts of the memory. They also tend to have persistent negative beliefs about oneself. There's an awful lot of guilt, shame, fear. I should have, I could have, I wish I would have done something different. So it's a morally fraught state usually where people feel like they should have done something different in that situation even though they were overwhelmed. And then they have distorted cognitions, uh, again, about kind of what they were doing or about how overwhelming the world was. And they just aren't very interested in a lot otherwise. Um, as I said, they have persistent negative states, fear, horror, anger, guilt, shame, markedly diminished interest in other activities. They feel detached from each other. They're really not available to be intimate. Intimacy is great. It's one of the great things in life, but it's threatening. And people who have... Uh, been traumatized uh, just don't feel capable or able uh, to either attach to other people or oftentimes to experience positive emotions which even to feel joy and happiness you have to be vulnerable to a certain extent and if you're all shut down you can't do that. Um, these are the issues that oftentimes other people see the most with patients with PTSD is they are pissed off a lot of times. And this is our classic image of the PTSD veteran who is, uh, you know, on a hair trigger alert, uh, really easy anger outbursts. When you start treating these people for chronic pain, maybe this will be your first hint that they have PTSD is that they're way angrier than you can figure out why. You know, what did I do? Um, nothing. You didn't do anything. All you did was approach this person and uh, that was enough to get into their anger zone. They may do uh, reckless and self-destructive behaviors that are tied in with managing this very high level of arousal. They're hypervigilant about any threats. The classic tripwire veterans that used to hang out in, after the Vietnam War with uh, tripwires around their Olympic uh, mountain hideaways. They're very easily startled, they have trouble concentrating, and a lot of sleep problems, which is one of the various reasons that they like benzodiazepines. So this is a diagram that sort of uh, tries to summarize that. This is uh, from my colleague, Carrie Stevens. So you can think of it as a cycle uh, that people are first exposed to trauma, uh, and then they develop symptoms. They ha and in order to be PTSD, they have to last at least a month, have significant distress or impairment. Then they have, have to have uh, at least one re-experiencing symptom of memories, dreams, flashbacks, etc. Re-experiencing is toxic, it's not enjoyable, people like to avoid it and they will avoid things that they think bring it on. Uh, so they're avoiding uh, not only the internal uh, memories but also external reminders that really can shut down their life because they may have to do a tremendous amount of avoiding to limit those stimuli. And then this creates a bit of a negative internal environment that they live in where there's uh, memory loss, negative belief, self-blame, negative emotions, uh, inability to feel pleasure, detached from other people and their positive emotions. And they're on edge. They're ready to face. I, I sometimes describe this to my patients. It's as if your fight or flight alarm got turned on and you can't turn it off, which is essentially what Pavlov was studying when he threw those dogs down the stairwell is that this is a, a potent and non-extinguishable uh, kind of learning where you end up with uh, irritability and anger, reckless problems and, and hypervigilance. So the good news, that's all a lot of bad news, right? The good news about PTSD is that most people exposed to traumatic events get better. Most people who have PTSD symptoms get better. So around 30% of people exposed to an extreme stressor will develop some of these symptoms within days of exposure, but they usually evolve within a, f a, a, disappear within a few weeks. So they don't even meet criteria for PTSD because you've got to have a month of symptoms. So, and they have tried to do debriefing of natural disasters where everybody's, you know, upset about a flood or an earthquake and it doesn't help. In fact, it hurts. People do better if you don't 
put them in co contact with mental health professionals at that point in time. <laughs> it's a pretty reliable finding, actually, that uh, the natural he healing process of culture works better than turning it into kind of a bit of psychopathology. So for 10 to 20 percent of people uh, who develop those initial PTSD symptoms, they will go on to have persistent impairment and functioning. But even in that group, about half will get better without treatment by, by the time a year rolls around. And only 10 to 20 percent will develop a chronic disorder. So it's a pretty limited group who really have chronic problems with this. And while the severity of the stressor determines to some degree who gets PTSD, a lot of it has to do with, you know, is that seed falling on fertile ground? Is the person vulnerable already, either for genetic or environmental, you know, usually early developmental reasons? So how many people actually have PTSD? This is the best information that we've got from the National Comorbidity Survey, around 7%. Twice as many women as men. In any given 12-month period, maybe 3 to 4% of people. You go into the groups that have had a lot of trauma, like Vietnam veterans, the rates are quite a bit higher, three, three times higher maybe in the Vietnam veterans. Uh, Iraq veterans also, Afghanistan veterans, I don't know if this has to be updated given the most recent people coming home, whether it's as high as the other veteran groups, but obviously people who've been in, uh, you know, severe uh, combat situations, they have higher rates. In the civilian populations, you might be seeing more of in your healthcare settings, you can see a lot of PTSD in particular situations. People who come for treatment after a motor vehicle accident, 30 to 40 percent. People who have ha suffered a significant assault, 30 to 40 percent. Even injured workers referred for rehabilitation. Remember, most injured workers get well all on their own. And so it's just a small fraction of them referred for rehab. But in that group, about a third. Fibromyalgia patients, maybe Currently, 20%, one in five, will have PTSD, although if you ask them whether they ever had PTSD, it can be double that. Um, of people who have PTSD, a third to a half have chronic pain, and at least as much the other way around. If you look at people with chronic pain, how many people have PTSD? It's a range, but I think you could think about a quarter to a half. Interestingly, in young adults in particular, PTSD is the psych disorder most strongly associated with medically unexplained pain. So, in young people with unexplained pain, look for trauma, even more so than older people. But I must tell you that in recent years, like the past decade, I'm just so impressed, maybe because of who we're seeing at the UW Pain Center, that. Uh, PTSD is a huge issue in uh, people with difficult to treat uh, chronic pain. And a lot of times nobody has ever talked to them about it. So what is the relationship between PTSD and pain? Why do they walk the same walk? Why do they appear in the same patients? Well, first of all, the pain itself can be enough to kick off PTSD. Uh, and there's well documented that severe acute pain uh, is traumatic and can predict PTSD. In fact, there's some evidence that early administration of opioids right around the time of original trauma can be protective of PTSD. It's very different than the chronic opioid story. Um, pain and PTSD can actually mutually maintain each other where chronic pain is one of those dreaded reminders and it keeps bringing you back to the uh, motor vehicle accident or the combat situation or the rape situation, all of a sudden it just feels like it's still happening and that keeps the PTSD grow going. Um, kind of a variant of that is the perpetual avoidance theory which where re-experiencing triggers arousal which leads to avoidance and pain through muscle tension. So you're kind of riding that same path around the same circle over and over again. And then one of my colleagues who uh, just happens to be called Sullivan, it's not me, Although we've made a deal, we could take credit for each other's, uh, <laughs> so uh, you can give me credit for this. But uh, Mick Sullivan, who is in uh, Montreal, uh, has found that actually a lot of people who have had chronic pain after a motor vehicle accident, or particularly after a workplace injury, that perceived injustice, you know, the thought that my employer was asking too much of me that day, or that 
you know, they forced me to work overtime and that's why I got hurt, etc. People who feel like their injury was associated with injustice, they have more PTSD, they have more disability, they have more chronic pain. And this particular study, he was studying whiplash injury, but it's true for lots of other chronic pain kinds. So just to give you a little bit of data, I, uh, Kevin was just so impressive with all the data, I'd give you a little bit. But this uh, is a study of Australian trauma patients where they looked at people at baseline three months and 12 months. And remember that we've got these domains of PTSD re-experiencing, avoidance, arousal, and then we've got chronic pain here. And what I want to draw your attention to is more this middle row. And uh, arousal and pain are uh, bolded because they seem to be the crucial way in which baseline symptoms get to be 12 month symptoms. That both uh, emotional arousal and pain tend to predict the perpetuation of pain and PTSD later. So the two feed off each other and they're both playing a role as it evolves from a problem around the time of the trauma to a year later. So what about PTSD and opioids? I want to get into treatment at this point. Karen Seal is an internist at UCSF. She's done a really nice study. She looked at 140,000 Iraq Afghanistan veterans. You may have seen this paper. It was in JAMA a few years ago. And uh, of that giant group of Iraq and Afghanistan vets, about 10% received any opioids. And the interesting thing is that of all the veterans without mental health disorders, about 6%. Of those who had mental health disorders without PTSD, about 12%. And of those with PTSD, 18%. So, very nice odds ratios here. Basically, a mental health disorder other than PTSD doubles your risk of getting opioids, and if it's PTSD, it triples your risk of getting opioids in this giant sample. And unfortunately, not only does it predict you getting opioids, it predicts you getting dangerous opioids and having bad results with opioids. So, not only did the PTSD veterans more likely to get opioids, they got higher dose opioids, they were more likely to be on two opioids. They were more likely to receive the sedative hypnotics concurrently, meaning the Valium, the benzos. They were more likely to get early opioid refills, so they were showing signs of opioid misuse. They were not kind of taking it on the schedule that was prescribed, and they had the highest rates of adverse clinical outcomes. A bad story, unfortunately. This has also been seen to some degree in civilians. Among indigent primary care patients, PTSD is associated with more pain and more use of opioids. Um, all of the PTSD symptoms seem to be related to increased pain and increased impairment, although the crucial thing that seems to be related to opioid use is avoidant symptoms. So those people who avoid the most or find avoidance the most important are the most likely to use opioids because opioids are part of the avoidance. Same with benzos. Um, in another study among uh, African-American mental health patients, PTSD was the most strongly associated with opioid use. There's some basic affinity, I'll, I'll talk about it in a couple slides, about PTSD per se and opioids. They, they like each other. Um, and violence or exposure uh, or PTSD predicts opioid abuse among teens. And in fact, the severity of PTSD also predicts the severity of opioid use. And that kind of doesn't depend on what opioid you're using. It, if you're using heroin, that's true. If you're using prescription opioids and sedatives, that's true. And even if you're using medical cannabis and opioids, that's true. And in fact, not only severity of opioid abuse, but also the duration of opioid use appears to be predicted by how much PTSD you've got. So what do opioids do for PTSD? And I, it took me a long time to construct this slide because it's actually a complicated story. Um, as you adapt to stress, your own brain tends to release beta endorphin in the amygdala, which is counter counteraction to the HPA. So hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system is kind of your stress responsive system. And trauma will be activating for that system. And there's sort of a countervailing system in your body which involves secreting opioids. And, and we know from animal experiments that unmanageable stress, like if you throw a rat 
into ice water and force them to swim to the point where they think they're going to die, their opioid system goes bananas. It just, you know, they get very profound, what's called stress-induced analgesia in that situation. And so overwhelming stress tends to activate your opioid system in a protective kind of way. And we know that acute mu opioids, now mu is the most common opioid receptor and that's what morphine activates. They tend to inhibit fear-related memory. And kappa opioids are another, it's the dynorphin group of endogenous opioids activate those receptors. They initially promote escape. They're not quite, they're not the sedating kind of mu opioid effect. But later they induce anxiety, depression, and drug craving. So the pattern that you see with the endogenous opioids is that early on they're helpful into the process of managing the trauma and then afterwards not so much. Because chronic opioid use is associated with avoidance of PTSD and it inhibits learning. It doesn't improve pain, depression, or anxiety. So this is just a little reminder what the endogenous opioid system looks like. Uh, you, basically these are the beta endorphins that work with the mu receptors and then the dynorphins work with the kappa receptors. It's a complicated uh, story. It's important to know that the endogenous opioids have many effects and all of which we don't really anticipate or plan on having when we flood the system with exogenous opioids. Okay, so David Taubin talked about the PTSD screening tool. I think this is a tremendous, easily used, well-validated instrument that I urge you to incorporate into your practice. Three out of four answers, and as you can see, we've got very, you know, the things I've talked about. Here we have your nightmares, uh, here we have your avoidance, here we have your hyperarousal and easily startled, here's the numb and withdrawal, and three out of four is a positive screen, which would uh, lead you to ask some more questions about what's going on. And as I said, I have many times had patients screen positive where there was no mention in the chart of PTSD whatsoever. Um, once you have identified that PTSD is an issue, the PCPTSD, that screening instrument, is not likely to be enough to track patients and see how they're doing. Um, then I would suggest uh, that you use an instrument now called the PCL5. It's available from the PTSD website that the VA maintains. I would have to tell you that this is a fabulous resource. I just went through it again. Uh, over this past week to pull resources in from this and it's a tremendous uh, set of, uh, of learning materials as well as screening tools and stuff for that. And then like David, uh, we each steal each other's thunder so this is not unusual that we kind of repeat each other but uh, also you want to track not only the PCL5 but pain interference with that PEG instrument that he talked about. I think that's very helpful and there's a reference for that. So what works for PTSD? The gold standard treatment is psychotherapy. That's a little inconvenient in a primary care situation where you might not have a therapist in your office. How many people have psychologists or psychotherapists in their office? Wow, a lot, great. All right, good. So this is really well documented to work. A couple of uh, Exposure therapy, often called prolonged exposure therapy, cognitive restructuring or cognitive processing therapy I'll talk about in a minute, cognitive behavior therapy, uh, kind of mixed therapies, also high evidence. This is the AHRQ 2012 review. Uh, EMDR, also evidence-based, although not super high quality, and narrative exposure therapy as well. So let me talk a little bit about those in a minute. but. Let me talk about pharmacotherapies because in at least medical settings this is often more available and maybe where you start. So the SSRI and SNRI antidepressants do have an evidence base. Um, the, uh, I just revised all my slides and somehow the revised versions did come through here. Um, Anyway, so the fluoxetine, paroxetine, and sertraline. Uh, paroxetine and sertraline are FDA approved, but the evidence base is probably the best for venlafaxine and paroxetine. I would say of these, I would probably recommend the venlafaxine first because it's an SNRI. It does, at least when you get over 150 milligrams, have pain relieving properties, so you might be killing two birds with one stone. 
It can be a little bit more arousing than some of the other drugs, uh, some of the other SSRIs, although if you uh, titrate up slowly. Um, and uh, so I did, hmm, I don't know why. Though. Let, me, let me talk, I just revised the slide in, late, in light of things. So one thing that the VA guideline really points out as an excellent medicine is nefazodone. Has anybody ever here written a prescription for nefazodone? Dr. Taubman. Okay, a few people. So what's the problem with nefazodone? There's a huge black box warning on it about liver failure. Um, so it's, a brand name was Surzone. It is off patent and has been for quite a while. It's kind of a cousin of trazodone. It's not nearly as sedating. But I used to use it before the liver warning came out quite a lot, particularly in this population because it's, I think, not necessarily the most potent antidepressant, but it's easily the most well tolerated. A lot of patients with PTSD, a lot of people who've been through repeated trauma cannot tolerate the anxiogenic effect of SSRIs or some of the other antidepressants. And I found in my experience they can almost always tolerate nefazodone. And once you get them started on that, you may be able to get them started on some other things as well. And so it was interesting when I looked through the VA guideline, they say that there's a very good evidence base for using nefazodone in PTSD. So that was surprising to me. I wanted to mention it to you. The liver failure issue is of concern. You certainly don't want to use this medication in anybody who's got evidence of liver disease or even increased liver function tests. But I have successfully, again with Dr. Taubin, uh, managed uh, patients. You know, you monitor their LFTs and you warn them about the issue. Uh, you can g get it to use, and it's like one in 10,000 that has problems with the liver. So it's not common, although it can be devastating in some patients. Um, antipsychotics are not recommended. Uh, actually, these anticonvulsants are not uh, particularly well recommended to, uh, to, to pyramate, um, uh, valproate, uh, tiagabine. Any of those don't work very well. Gabapentin doesn't work very well. Uh, bupropion or Wellbutrin is used a lot but does not have an evidence base. Um, and uh, I think that the general guideline about antipsychotic use is avoid them. There is a fair bit of use of the sedating atypical agents in PTSD because it's really hard to get these patients to sleep and so people like to give them a little quetiapine or otherwise known as Seroquel. Uh, also, olanzapine or Zyprexa will be, get used a lot. They do tend to work to keep the patients asleep initially over the long term. Uh, Prazosin works better, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. The benzodiazepines, why are they not recommended? Because they essentially it, in, it entrenches and reinforces avoidance. You can't learn when you're on benzos. They're well known to inhibit behavioral treatment of like phobias and anxiety and it also inhibits uh, the kind of learning and breaking through avoidance that you need to do in PTSD. It's uh, tough to get patients off of them um, but that's an important part of treating them. So as you negotiate psychotherapy or pharmacotherapy um, I'll talk about simple grounding exercises and behavioral activation that you can do in a primary care setting. If you can get people into psychotherapy, that is very helpful because they have a larger effect sizes. They're more efficacious than the pharmacotherapies. And most treatment guidelines, like the VA here and the NICE guidelines from the UK, also recommend psychotherapies as first line. Um, I put down here about exposure and proxetine uh, was superior to exposure in one trial. In general, Adding psychotherapy to meds, if you've got somebody on meds, they're partially responding, getting them into psychotherapy, that will help. Adding meds to psychotherapy, not so much. The, it is not that helpful. You're not going to get much more of an additional effect. Um, okay, so one basic thing you can do on a psychotherapeutic level in a primary care setting is to treat dissociation through grounding. So what's dissociation? It's kind of going on a mental vacation. Little kids do this a lot if they're facing overwhelming situations. They'll just like 
be absent. They'll disengage from the situation. I mean, classic dissociative symptoms are ones like depersonalization, where you feel kind of disconnected from your body, or you feel as if parts of your body are unreal, or your, even your voice will sound foreign to you, like uh, someone else's voice. That's depersonalization. Also, another dissociative symptom is derealization, where you might be in a very familiar environment, like your own living room, and it will feel like I've never been here before. It's like the opposite of deja vu, where you've, you've not been there, but you think you have. It, all, it, it feels like it's all foreign to you. So dissociation is uh, common in traumatized patients, and it is, it's, it's, it's a part of avoidance. It's counterproductive. I've had patients, severely traumatized patients, where the minute you get into any kind of difficult material in therapy, they're like dissociating. Sometimes their eyes roll up. Sometimes they're just kind of absent and they don't answer you for a little while. So it's dangerous and dysfunctional for the patient. There's evidence it shuts down immune functioning. And you can, first of all, let patients know what it is. What, what's going on? Why is this happening? What are you doing? Why might you want to do something different? And then you can teach very basic grounding skills. Just cue people to like being here and now. You know. What date is it? Where are you now? And even just name five things that you can see right now. Name five things you can hear or feel. So it's like mindfulness is a great antidote to dissociation. Bringing yourself into the present and just describing what is an immediate sensory experience for you. That's a good antidote to dissociation. The other thing that's a kind of a basic first aid level of therapy for PTSD is behavioral activation. So avoidance just keeps the PTSD merry-go-round going, around and around. Limiting function, reinforcing anxiety, and increasing pain interference because the pain is keeping you from doing stuff and all this avoidance associated with PTSD is keeping you from doing stuff. So what you have to do is encourage people to do new things and they will seem risky. They will feel stupid to the patient. I'm just asking for trouble by A, you know, asking my friend to go for coffee or, you know, walking down the road or all sorts of quite simple things can seem very threatening and what you're there for is to support people and help them through that fear so that by doing things they can realize Life's got good stuff out there too, and if you put yourself out there, then you will encounter new friends, new experiences, new relationships, but you have to get out of your bed and probably out of your house to have those new experiences. So the clue is to start really small. You want people to try something and succeed. It doesn't have to be a big thing, but it, it should be a new thing and they should have some success and that can really start the ball rolling in the right direction. So what are the best uh, evidence-based practices for PTSD? Uh, the two that are the finest uh, evidence-based are called prolonged exposure developed by Edna Foa and I think because I ended up with the wrong slides here I'm going to just do this from memory. So prolonged exposure really has to do with addressing the feelings that you have, the overwhelming emotions in the face of the traumatic event. So uh, in prolonged exposure, you do some initial education about what PTSD is, what psychological trauma is. You teach people some basic calming, self-soothing exercises, relaxation training like breathing to just be able to bring yourself back down after you're aroused and then you work on exposing the patient to the trauma and that can be real life exposure. You can go walk to the corner where they had the car accident but more commonly you have people imagine it being in the back in the situation and you then work with them to manage the anxiety and the fear that they have in that situation. Uh, this, these therapies tend to take 10 to 12 sessions. They're not instantaneous, but given the fact that they double the chance of remission of PTSD and they look like they work for five years after you've had these 10 or 12 sessions, it's an impressive uh, track record. 
Cognitive processing therapy is a little bit different. It has to do with really addressing the thoughts that you have. Remember that people tend to have complicated, shameful, guilty, blaming, or catastrophic thoughts associated with their trauma. So they tend to think, I could have or I should have done something different. I should have been quicker. I should have rescued my buddy. I shouldn't have killed that baby. You know, uh, I couldn't, uh, I should have been able to avoid the rape. Or I, it's partly my, f all that stuff. And also, uh, very global negative cognitions about the world. And cognitive processing therapy, rather than focusing on imagery and feeling, it actually focuses more on the narratives and, and often has people write out uh, accounts of their traumatic and work through the written account. Again, using relaxation and the therapist to remain safe through that exposure. Um, a couple of other therapies maybe I can talk about in the workshop concern EMDR, which is eye movement uh, reprocessing and desensitization, that's uh, more commonly available. Uh, and it is, again, a desensitizing uh, treatment that involves eye movements or hand movements. And it's not clear that the eye movements or hand movements are necessary, but they may serve a grounding function the same way that we were talking about getting the patient to kind of not dissociate by reminding them to see, or, see hear, and feel things. Um, and at this point, the evidence-based versions are 10 to 12 sessions, although uh, people are working on getting briefer versions. So what are the dangers here? This is sort of, you know, don't try this at home unless you know what you're doing. The dangers with these therapies are that people can get the exposure without the coping or avoidance prevention. So that can happen if this therapist isn't skilled enough, but more commonly it happens when the patients bolt in the early phases of therapy. You know, if somebody just comes in for one or two sessions, they really haven't gotten to the point where they're mastering that reimagined trauma. Um, so one, a good therapist has to guard against that. Repressed memories are pretty much discredited. You're not supposed to use hypnosis or other drugs to kind of achieve access of traumatic memories. Uh, that has both significant iatrogenic potential and the memories themselves are often not real. Uh, so also exploring the past in psychotherapy uh, is problematic. So when you're thinking about a patient getting into this therapy, you want them to be able to come to sessions, that they've got some support. One thing that's typical about these therapies is because it involves getting back into this traumatic material, they can get worse before they get better and there needs to be a structure both in terms of the therapist and in terms of their family support to manage the fact that they might have worsened uh, symptoms for a while. So, of course, we're in the modern era and there's an app for that. So, uh, it turns out that the, um, the DOD, National Center for PTSD, and the National Center for Telehealth and Technology, which is at, at Fort Lewis, just north of Tacoma, or south of Tacoma, have developed a, a coaches that can be uh, used for self-management of post-traumatic stress. Uh, PTSD coach is a general one, and then there's specific ones for cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure. Uh, you can uh, find these on your iPhone or your Android device. I uh, have them on my phone. I urge you to just look at them and see what people are talking about. Um, finally, and not least, uh, I have three minutes left, and I will tell you a little bit about Prazosin, which was rediscovered by one of my colleagues at the Seattle VA. He was thinking, oh, I'm going to try beta blockers to treat PTSD symptoms, and I need to find a good control medication that will have symptoms similar to the beta blockers and allow me to go do a good trial. And voila, it turned out that the control substance worked and the supposedly active substance didn't. That's how Prazosin was rediscovered. It was marketed, I think, a long time ago, 80s maybe or 90s, uh, as mini press for uh, blood pressure control. It's not a great blood pressure medication, but it turns out to be a great medication for uh, PTSD, specifically nightmares and re-experiencing. It's a central alpha-1 adrenergic receptor antagonist, so it basically reduces sympathetic outflow from your CNS, reducing norepinephrine-driven stimulation, startle, and the nightmares of PTSD. It's been proven in multiple small RCTs to improve nightmares. There's a big multi-center RCT underway at the VA. Uh, 
And it's sort of, it's, it's a bit of an interesting story about its spread because it's a generic drug, it's cheap as dirt, but there's no drug reps to push it. So it's disseminating quite slowly and you can watch, see these ripples because it came out of the Seattle VA and regionally people use it. I don't know, people use praises in here? Uh, see? We're all in the Northwest. But you talk to people in Oklahoma or Alabama, they're like, yeah, I never heard of that. Um, it has been tested against quetiapine. They both help in the short term, but prazosin works a lot better in the long term. I uh, am getting the, the hook here. I will talk more in workshops about details about how to use it. And I uh, will just mention that, in fact, we were able to do some help with Suzanne, who used, uh, as you can see, a number of medications as well as EMDR. You can see we're able to get her on things like prazosin and not completely get her off things like alprazolam but we were working in the right direction. So, uh, this is my conclusion. Physical and psychological trauma both contribute to pain chronicity and knowing something about PTSD and even just some basic things about what to do and not do for it, I think can really help your chronic pain patients. Thank you.